Hey, welcome back everyone. We're going to be taking a look at the AP Calculus B final questions 6, 7, and 8, starting here with question 6. We've got functions below showing the first and second derivatives of uh, y equals f of x, and we're supposed to draw a possible graph that passes through the point P. Let's start by analyzing that first derivative. You can see at the left side of the uh, y-axis, we've got a relative minimum here at this x-coordinate. And that's because the first derivative is going to change from negative to positive. And assuming that the function is continuous, that's going to be, uh, though that's going to signal us that we have a relative minimum here. Likewise, we have ourselves a relative maximum over at this x-coordinate, since the first derivative changes from a positive to a negative. Uh, and that's going to be enough for us. Um, if you're skilled at reading these graphs, then you also don't need that second derivative uh, graph here, because over at uh, the coordinate x equals 0, we can see that the slope of the first derivative changes from positive to negative. So here in yellow, the slope of the first derivative is positive. We can see that over here at the second derivative. And we can also see um, over here when x is positive, the slope of the first derivative is negative. So again, assuming that we have a continuous function, that would mean that we have a point of inflection at x equals 0. Summi summarizing that, uh, we have a relative minimum at a point x equals negative a, where a is a positive number. We've got a relative maximum at x equals a, where again a is a positive number. And we've got a point of inflection at x equals 0. So Let's get ourselves a coordinate axis to draw our possible, uh, possible graph of f of x. OK, here's a coordinate axis. And we're supposed to have a relative minimum somewhere down over here. Let's drop, let's put a point right over here. and. Get a relative minimum here. We're supposed to have a relative maximum over here. And we're supposed to have a point of inflection at, well, at P, right? At P over there. So there's our three coordinates. Let's move my cursor so you don't think that that's one. Let's do a little bit of adjusting here and get this point a little higher up there. Maybe get this point a little bit lower down over there. And so let's remember that we're supposed to be concave up on the left. So concave up like that. And then concave down on the right side of that. Oops, wrong color. Concave down. Kind of like that. Oop. Let's make that look more like we have a maximum there. There we go. Concave down kind of like that. So as long as our function kind of adheres to that, and really there's only one way to do it, or pretty much one way to do it, uh, we should have our solution curve, or a possible solution curve. So here's a possible solution curve. Again, it doesn't, the only y-coordinate that matters is this point P right over here. Since that was the only point that was specified in our question. So that's our number six, and let's take a look at question seven. This says that the velocity of a particle in feet per second is given by t cubed minus 12t minus nine, where t is time in seconds, and t is greater than or equal to zero. So we're supposed to find a time when the velocity is a minimum. This sounds to me like we want to minimize a function, and the function that we want to minimize is t cubed minus 12t minus 9. Great. Let's take a look at our first derivative. And for this problem specifically, and for most problems like this, 
I probably would not recommend to you that you say, hey, well, I know the first derivative of velocity is acceleration. So I'm going to write at here instead of vt. And I think that's a mistake because we're trying to minimize velocity or we're trying to find a relative extrema for velocity, absolute extrema for velocity. So putting acceleration here just kind of muddies the waters. We want to think in terms of the velocity. What is the derivative of the velocity? And eventually, what is the second derivative of velocity? I don't care that it's called acceleration. Let's see. Uh, 3t squared minus 12. Um, that's going to equal 0 when uh, t equals negative 2 and when t is equal to positive 2. But of course, we're taking a look at our fun at our uh, question, and we see that t has got to be greater than zero, which means that this one, where t is equal to two, that one doesn't. That's not going to do anything for us. So, really, the only thing we're going to take a look at is t equals two, since that's our only critical value. It's either going to be the absolute minimum or the absolute maximum. We just got to figure out which is which. And I think I should be a little bit careful here with you because we are saying that this is the only critical value. So if there's only one critical value, then it's either going to be the relative minimum or the relative maximum. It can't, well, I guess it could be neither. But uh, let's just go with this. Uh, actually, let's, let's test and see what it is. Um, let's go with the second derivative test. Let's also look at the first derivative test. Um, I guess we can start with the first derivative test. Remember, in our first derivative test, we're going to uh, analyze the first derivative on the intervals that exclude our critical values. Um, and since our domain begins at t equals 0, we are going to start by looking at the interval from 0 to 2. And then we'll go from 2 to positive infinity. Now for our first interval from 0 to 1, I can't substitute 0, uh, which would be my first choice. I can't substitute an absurdly large number. So I guess I'll have to substitute uh, 1 here. So let's substitute the value 1. We've got 3 multiplied by 1 squared minus 12. That looks like it's going to be a negative value to me, so less than 0. And over here, uh, any number between 2 to positive infinity. And again, I like to be pick an absurdly large number to make that calculation easy. So by picking 100 and substituting, we will get 3 times 100 squared. That's a very large number. Um, and then if we subtract 12, it doesn't really matter what the result is. I know that that's going to be greater than 0. So it looks as though the first derivative is changing from negative to positive, which is indicative of a relative minimum at t equals, uh, t equals 2. So summary, since the first derivative of velocity changes from negative to positive, there is a relative minimum at t equals 2. Now option 2 then is going to be the second derivative test. Let's have a look at that. Now for the second derivative test, we need to look at the second derivative of the function we want to minimize or maximize. So the second derivative of velocity. Well, that's just going to be 6t. We substitute our critical value into the second derivative. We get that the second derivative at 2 is just 6 multiplied by 2. Don't Not really interested in what the result is. I just know that that result is going to be positive. So if it's positive, if the second derivative evaluates that positive on a critical value, that means that we our function is concave up. And since the function of v is concave up, that means that it must have a relative minimum at its critical value t equals 2. 
So I hope you can see that the second derivative test came in handy here. It was actually a lot faster to do than the first derivative test. Um, so uh, I encourage you to use the second derivative test. Let's uh, take a look at question eight. I think that's going to be the last one we're going to do here. Water is falling on a surface, wetting a circular area that is expanding at a rate of four square millimeters per second. How fast is the radius of the wetted area expanding when the radius is 12 millimeters? So the thing I want to check first right now is that all of the units are kind of the same. And taking a look here, we've got units of millimeters per second, square millimeters per second. We've got units of millimeters. So nothing's going to be a problem. I'm also going to notice the, this problem likes a trick by giving me the diameter instead of the radius. And um, let's check here. I have the radius is 15. So I'm okay to substitute the radius as, or that 15, I'm okay to substitute that as the radius. Uh, the next thing I'm going to think about is, well, what kind of problem is this? Uh, well, I, I see millimeters squared per second. Uh, that is a rate. So when I see a rate here, I, that immediately makes me think related rates. And if I want to know about the area, um, the expanding area, then that says to me that I'm going to, to need the um, area formula for, in this case, a circle. So what is the area formula for a circle? All right, not particularly difficult. Let's take derivatives with respect to t. Let me zoom in a little bit here. So we got the derivative with respect to t of the area is equal to the derivative with respect to t of the area formula. Now the derivative with respect to t of a, well, that's just dA dt. And the derivative of pi r squared, well, that's the derivative of, that's pi multiplied by the derivative of r, which is 2r. And that's going to be times the derivative of r. So d dt of r, because as we notice, the, we're taking the derivative with a function that is, or with the variable that's not r. And just like before, the derivative of r with respect to t, that's just going to be dr dt. That gives me this formula where dA dt is 2 pi r multiplied by dr dt. Remember not to do any substituting unless you're positive you have a constant and not until you've taken your derivatives. Since I haven't done any substituting up till this point, now that I've taken my derivative, I can go ahead and, uh, ooh, just noticed a uh, typo here. Sorry about that. Uh, but now that I've taken my derivative, I'm free to substitute any of these numbers. So let's see, four, four millimeters squared per second. That's the area, that's the uh, rate that the circular area is expanding. So in other words, that's dA dt. Let's change dA dt to a four. Okay, and the next thing is the radius is 15. So let's change the radius into 15. And that's going to leave the only variable as dr dt, which would be the rate that the radius is expanding uh, in this case. Could also be contracting, but that's okay. Uh, let's divide both sides by two. Clean up a little bit on the right side here. And then we'll divide both sides by 15 pi. And that gives me dr dt is uh, 2 over 15 pi, which would, of course, be the rate that the radius is increasing. So uh, I think it'd be fair here to write a quick summary. 
And that gives us the radius of the circle is increasing at a rate of uh, 2 over 15 pi millimeters per second when that radius is 15 millimeters. So that's going to do it for this second video in this series. This was questions 6 through 8, and we'll see you next time for the next few questions.